And the people of God said together, Amen. Won't you join me in blessing God for the gift of Sister Dutton, who has facilitated a move of God today. Amen. I'm still struggling vocally, so I ask your prayers as we try to get through the Easter motif. I invite you to stand now that we might unshelve from the sacred library the gospel according to John. And there in verse, in chapter 20, commencing with at verse 11 and concluding at verse 18, we find the basis for our dialogue today. The text reads, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping and whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Thus ends the reading of the word, amen. You may be seated. I want to put a tag on this text and talk temporarily from the topic, the sound of his voice. The sound of his voice. As we peruse this pericope, I think it's safe to say that Mary is a mess. She is an emotional wreck. The tremors of Friday are still rumbling deep in her soul. And she is grieving with a palpable grief that is visible to all of the world. She rises early on Sunday morning to make her way back to the tomb and there with horror, she finds that the stone has been rolled away. Presupposing, uh, in spite of the evidence, that someone had stolen Jesus' body, she's terrified even more. Doesn't matter that the evidence doesn't speak otherwise because text says that the grave clothes were neatly arrayed and grave robbers usually don't have time to be that meticulous. But her heart is broken and evidence doesn't make sense. And so having seen the tomb opened, which ought to be sealed, and having experienced an empty tomb where, where the body of Jesus should be lying, she makes her way to the community of disciples and tells Peter and the others that the stone has been rolled away. The Bible says that Peter 
in his old age strikes out and the disciple that Jesus loves companions him for part of the journey, but his youthful vitality causes him to get ahead of the old man Peter and he gets to the tomb, looks in and the Bible says he believes and Peter finally makes it with creaking knees and a sore back simply because he's now old. He looks in and the text says that both of them go home. But Mary, who is a wreck, an emotional bundle of mixed emotions, Mary, who is a mess, stays right there at the tomb. Now, before we cast judgment on Mary because she seems to be emotional and we in our ignorant and arrogant ways often ascribe excessive emotions to women, uh, we do remember that uh, the Lord has done a whole lot for Mary. Uh, this, this Mary who, whom Jesus has uh, excommunicated uh, or exercised seven demons. It's this Mary that he has uh, violated social codes and taken her under his wing to become her mentor in spiritual matters. It's this Mary who we presumably has uh, worshipped him by breaking open her ointment and washing his feet and then uh, drying them with her hair. It's this Mary that, that has been the beneficiary of grace and mercy all along the way on her journey. And so one understands naturally that when you experience a loss of this depth, then the grieving ought to be commensurate. I often am baffled by folks who can say they love someone and lost them and never shed a tear, never demonstrate any palpable forms of grief. Mary is hurting here, and Mary is simply a mess. But notice the text. Even though she's a mess, She's unmoved. I'm preaching to somebody here because she says, I'm going to stick with Jesus no matter what comes. My life may be in disarray. My heart may be broken. My mind may be skewed. My behavior may be abnormal. My actions may prove that I, I've got a marginal at best commitment to the Lord. But whatever I do, I'm not going to leave Jesus. She's a mess, but she's unmoved. And somebody here ought to be able to say that that's my testimony. I came here a mess today, but I came because I needed something from the Lord. I came because he's got healing in his wings. I came because I needed a touch from the master. I came because can't nobody do me quite like Jesus. She's a mess, but she's unmoved. And so that her grief does not paralyze her, the Bible says that she gets near the tomb and peeps in. And she sees a new altar having been erected. A place where the sacrifice of lambs had been with cherubs on the end now has been emptied where the Lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world and an angel at the head and an angel at the foot. And they then engage her in conversation. Why are you weeping? What an odd question. It is, after all, a cemetery. Why are you crying? If you only knew what had happened on Friday, you might cry too. Why are you crying? That's their question. And here is her retort. 
Here is the meaning for the mess in her life. They've taken away the Lord. They took him. And I don't know where he is. They is such an amorphous, nondescript way of putting things and anchoring things in the context of human experience. They took him. And as we survey our world today, we, like Mary, can experience and do experience the case of the missing Jesus. Where have they laid him? Where is Jesus? When we look at our world today, if we define the quest of life always as a search for the Lord, whether we are cognizant or unaware, where is Jesus? We look at our society, which is so driven by egotism and selfishness, and we see very little community and sharing. Where's Jesus? When we see our families disintegrating such that a 12-year-old little girl is now arrested for murdering a 64-year-old man, where is Jesus? When our institutions no longer reflect the piety and the person of the Christ, but are now driven by bottom line realities and prophets, where's Jesus? And we think not, we need not think that because we are in the church that the question doesn't apply to us. Because there are so many times when we gather in person, online, or any other form, and we've got an aggregation, but we don't have a congregation. Where is Jesus? Where's the divine spirit that liberates and brings back to life dead things? Where is Jesus? the one whose touch can still soothe and transform. Where is Jesus even in church when we've got a whole lot of sounding brass and tinkling cymbal, but no real substantive presence? Where is Jesus? I wish I had a voice to preach this thing. Where is Jesus? You've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Here, that is the question. Where is Jesus? Who are you looking for today? Are we coming to gather, to experience, as Sister Dedden said, I just want to be with you? Or have we come out of mere habit and conditioning? Did we come to join the frocks in the Easter parade or did we really come to have an encounter with the risen Christ? Where is Jesus and what did you come looking for? She comes, she converses with angels, but even conversations with angels are not sufficient enough to soothe her grief. But how many of you know that when you're talking with heavenly things and dealing with heavenly things, that if you just stay around long enough, the Lord might just show up. Where is Jesus? 
They have taken him away. I don't know where he is. And as she continues to wrestle with her question and her issues, she begins to talk with the Lord. Yeah. Now, to be honest, the text says she doesn't recognize him. And again, before we cast judgment on Mary, we must understand the context in order to understand the text. For you do know it is dark, even though it's early in the morning, it's still dark. Jesus is not yet recognizable, it's dark. And because she's been crying, and the, the lexical tour de force of the Greek is that not only has she been crying, but she can't stop crying. She thinks that the risen Christ is the gardener. And he asked her similarly the question of angels. Why? Are you crying? And who are you looking for? Who? To which she says, sir, if you just tell me where you put him, I'll take him away. I'll lift a grown man with the little mite that I have and I'll take him away. If, if you just tell me where you have laid him, at that moment, the gospel in the text begins to echo against the canyon walls of our consciousness. For there was something special and unique that took place in the moment. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, the king of glory, Jesus, the now elevated Lord of lords, resurrected from the dead with the keys of hell and death in his hand, does something unique. He calls her by her name. Mary. You do know, beloved, that there's power in his voice. There's a power in the word of the Lord that we cannot neglect. Mary, Mary, Mary. She, there is music in his pronunciation. Mary, and in that moment, something takes place. She now realizes that she's not talking to a hired hand in the cemetery. That she's not really conversing any longer with angels. This voice is no ordinary voice. This voice is the voice that when it spoke, light began to dance across the dark night of creation. This voice, when it spoke, dead folks began to rise. For I heard this voice say, Lazarus, come out. This voice was the voice that said to demons, leave her alone. And they inhabited the, the swine and ran off the cliff. This voice is the voice of the good shepherd who knows his sheep and he calls them by name and not another will they follow. This voice is still speaking today. This voice is still calling people to rise. This voice still has a word for your condition. This voice knows your struggle and what you're going through. This voice says Mary. Don't miss it, beloved, because in this one exchange, this one vocal exchange, there's a whole lot going on theologically. For in his calling her Mary, it suggests to us that the risen Christ knows his disciples. Right. 
and he does not know them in some generic or broad way, but he knows me by my name. Somebody ought to shout right there. When you think of all the folk that you know and all of the folks that you are connected with on social media and all the folks that got your number and all of the folks that try to slip something in your DM that don't even know you, but praise be to God that the Savior of the world knows you so well, so intimately, so righteously that he knows you by your name. And because he knows her, she knows him. Rabuni, which means not just teacher, but my teacher. Suggesting that the intimacy of the relationship has a certain familiarity that constitutes connection beyond the usage of titles. I know the Lord and you know the Lord and I don't need to have a title to get in the way of my communication. And any of you ever been in trouble, you know that you ain't always got time to get cute with your prayers. When you're on 495 and somebody pulls in front of you, what do you say, Jesus? Somebody menacing comes in the grocery store while you there, Jesus. You ain't got time to get your prayer language right. But if you know the Lord for yourself, you can call him. Because he knows you and you know him. There's a connection. Because you are always on God's radar screen. Let me see if I can't make this thing take on legs so that it walks through the corridors of your consciousness. When I was in Atlanta, still, I had a chance meeting with one of the leading personalities of the community. This was not an orchestrated meeting, um, but when I engaged her, she called me Reverend Victor. Now I'm watching her on television, but I have no idea that she knows who I am and knows me by my name, but she calls me Reverend Victor. It's a chance meeting, so it's not as if her advance team have prepped her uh, for a meeting and she would know who I am, but she calls me by my name, and I'm wondering, how is it that she knows my name? I see her, but she don't know me, but then she does know me, but that's the way it is. When you're on God's radar screen... He knows you by your name. He knows your down sittings and he knows your uprisings. He knows your going ins and he knows your coming out. And because he intimately created you before you were knit in your mother's womb, he knows you by your name. He doesn't do like some of us do. When we are in social environments and we can't remember folks' name, oh, sweetie, how you doing? <laughs> Honey, you sure looking good today. But aren't you glad he calls you by your name? Whatever your name is, he knows your name. And I even dare say he knows you not only by your name, but by your nickname. He knows some June bugs. He knows some baby Ray Rays. He knows all of his people by their name. The sound of his voice meant there was recognition. But the sound of his voice also meant there was redirection. Look at the text. When he says to her, Mary, Bible says, she turned. Somebody got it. She turned. And the moment of grief was replaced with great joy because he spoke to her and she turned. I'm just glad that God's word can still turn you. 
so that negatives can become positives that gutturals can be glorified that setbacks can become setups and mess ups can become masterpieces i'm glad that when he heard when she heard his voice she turned somebody here may need a turn today turn from your wicked ways turn from your grief turn from your misery turn from your mistakes because the Lord is still speaking sound of his voice meant there was music to her in that there was a recognition there was a redirection and then there's a ruling the first commandment of the risen Christ is not a commissioning to the disciples to go into the world. It is not a, an endorsement of mission, miss, missional enterprises and undertakings. The first commandment given to Mary, don't keep holding That's the tour de force of the Greek, which means that in their exchange, Mary had already embraced the Lord. But he tells her, let go, because I have yet to ascend. I've not yet gone up to be with my father, I'm still Jesus of Nazareth and yet to become the cosmic Christ, I'm not yet ascended, so let go. Seems strange. First of all, because Mary as a woman by culture should not be embracing a holy man. But Jesus is not offended by that. It seems odd that he gives her this commandment because they have been intimately connected throughout the journey. Jesus is not offended by her embrace. Jesus is offended by or commands her to don't hold on. For you see, beloved, this is John's gospel, unlike any of the other gospels, where you have what we call the Johannine Pentecost. This has to be a fulfillment of one of Jesus' previous proclamations that if I leave, something else greater will come. That I'll give you access to the paraclete, to the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit can't come till I leave. So Mary, let go of me because the power is on its way. And beloved, sometimes I would submit to you that we, like Mary, can hold on to Jesus with narrow and myopic theologies that prevent the Spirit of God from demonstrating God's self in some of our situations. Whenever you say God can't do something, that's when God wants to do something. Let Jesus go so he can become fully who he is. Let Jesus go so that the work can fully be completed. Let Jesus go so that death does not have a bind, that that burial is not the final form of life, that resurrection can indeed take place and that ascension and glorification can transpire. Let Jesus go. What a tendency we have to hang on to the Lord because it's comforting and it's convenient but it is not allowing God to do God's fullest work. So when we in the community of faith begin to consign people as judges to where Jesus wants to love, we have then held on to Jesus too tightly. 
let him go. Mary, let go. Don't hold on to me. And then the Bible says that he gives her the first commissioning. Go tell my brothers that I'm going up yonder. Go, go tell them because we are a part of a new family. Go tell them we are no longer bound by earthly familiar cords and traditions, but I'm going to my father and your father, my God and your God, so that now there's a new community of folks who are bound by the blood and not by pedigree. I'm glad that, that all you gotta do is just come to Jesus as a mess, just like Mary, and he can put you in a new family, a family that may not be perfect, but it's a family that follows Jesus. Go and tell them. And the Bible says, beloved, that she went and gave the greatest Easter declaration of all. Many of us grew up in a church tradition where there were always Easter speeches. My earliest, earliest foray into public speaking was two years of age, standing before the Moors Mission Church, having been coached months in advance by my grandmama at two years of age to stand up straight, square your shoulders, and don't be doing all that rocking and stuff. All of that preparation for two words, happy, three days, three words, happy Easter day. It was a great declaration, it was a truthful declaration. But Mary here gives the greatest declaration of all. One that is at the seed, that is the cement of the church's faith. She says, not in grandiose theological language that uses the Christological nomenclature of the academy. She does not use soteriological language to talk about the salvific work of the Lord. She does not use eschatological language that talks about the future that is to come in the Christ. She does not use the language of prolepsis, which talks about living in the now as that as the future is yet to unfold. No, she simply said, I've seen. That's it right there. I've seen the Lord. I want to do a have anybody here that can say like Mary, I've seen the Lord. Because that's what faith is all about. I've seen the Lord. And now joy has a possibility. I've seen the Lord. Hope now will never go on holiday. I've seen the Lord. My salvation is secure. I've seen the Lord. And he wiped the tears from my eyes. I've seen the Lord. And he changed my disposition. I've seen the Lord. And I ain't what I used to be. I've seen the Lord. Do I have one or two travelers that are willing to testify that I have seen the Lord? That's my Easter speech. I've seen the Lord. I've seen him in the watch fires of a hundred thousand camps. I've seen the Lord in every, in the glitter and glimpse of every sunrise. I have seen the Lord. And that, beloved, is why we've come today. I've seen the Lord. Seen him with my own eyes. 
I've heard his mellifluous honey-like voice. I, I've seen the Lord. And my seeing the Lord has made a difference. And so, beloved, she goes and tells the boys, as the first preacher of the resurrection, the first preacher of the resurrection, I have seen the Lord. You jokers went home, but I stayed around long enough to see the Lord. There may be somebody here today, whether you're online or in person, that's seen the Lord. For he has risen in your life to sensitize you to his presence, which often seems mysterious and sometimes even void. But I've seen the Lord. I've seen him move in this congregation. I've seen him move in your lives. I've seen the Lord. Have you seen him? Have you seen him? One is coming. Is there another? Have you seen the Lord? All you got to do is look back over your life and those unexplained moments is the hand of the Lord on your life. You're here today not because the car accident wasn't that bad, but the hand of the Lord intervened. You're here today not because you didn't get wiped out in a bankruptcy, but you're here today because the Lord is supplying as a faithful shepherd all of your needs on a daily basis. Just look back over your life. That hospital stay that was nearly fatal because the doctors made a mistake, but you're still here. Scenario after scenario, situation after situation, circumstance after circumstance. Just look back over your life and what you can't explain, there's your answer. It was God. Monies that came from nowhere. Resources that were applied. A neighbor that knocked on your door or a stranger that gave you something and just said, the Lord told me. to help you out. You see the hand of the Lord laid gently but weightily upon your life. If there is another today either online or in the house that has seen the Lord, then the mandate from the text is clear. Go tell the other brothers and the other sisters that he is risen. I've seen the Lord. Are there others today that have seen him? If so, this is the moment of acknowledgement. We invite you to come. As the choir sings, the doors of the church are open. We extend an invitation to Christian discipleship, whomsoever will. Let him or her come. For this is the moment that you've been waiting for. And this is the moment in which the sound of his voice will change the trajectory of your life. Whatever your mess may be, come on. Jesus is still speaking 
and calling you unto himself. As the choir sings, will there be others to come for this moment of decision for discipleship? I have no doubt my God can do the impossible. I know he can. I seen him do it. He can turn the mess you're in into an awesome miracle. I know he can. I see him do it. Whatever problem you've got, if you just give it to God.